My name is Sergio Pashka. For the past 13 years, I have been developing new technology that allows us to grow living tissue that mimics specific regions of the human brain and can be created from any person using stem cells derived from their own skin or blood. It sounds a bit like science fiction, but we now do this routinely in the lab. I'll explain how in a moment, but let me tell you why this is important. Our inability to readily access the living human brain is a great obstacle to finding treatments for brain disorders such as autism and schizophrenia. To make progress, we need to find a way to understand the underlying mechanisms. Reconstituting living brain tissue outside the body allows us to study how the brain works and how its different regions interact in a non-invasive way. It also allows us to study how the brain develops and how that development might be affected by its genes or by factors in the environment that cause disease. This could help us treat and possibly cure certain brain disorders. This isn't a brain. It's a collection of growing cells that make up a small part of a human brain. Think of a player's avatar in a video game. The brain tissue we've created in our lab, like the game avatar, is a simplified version of a part of the brain. And we can study it without a fear of injuring or interfering with the real patient's brain. So, how do we do it? Not long ago, it was shown that mature cells in tissue can be pushed back in time. The resulting cells, called induced pluripotent stem cells, can be obtained from skin cells or blood cells and have the potential to become any cell in the human body. In 2011, I created here at Stanford Medicine our first collection of living brain cells from patients. We started by asking a patient to painlessly provide a very small skin sample. We then reprogrammed those skin cells so that they became stem cells. We then put them in a medium, a kind of chemical soup that helps them grow and change. By providing various molecular cues in this medium, we were able to guide them to become specialized brain cells. These cells grew at the bottom of a lab dish and acquired the dish's flat two-dimensional shape, which is very different from the three-dimensional shape they have inside the body. They also didn't last long, and we needed a way to be able to observe their development over a greater period of time. That was when we started trying to create more complex cultures. By using a variety of techniques, we coaxed the stem cells to come together into a three-dimensional round cluster of cells that we called a spheroid after its shape. Unlike the flat collection of brain cells, these three-dimensional spheroids could be maintained for years, allowing for the development of more complex characteristics. Because these cells could be formed into the tissue of just about any organ, they ultimately became collectively known as organoids. As it turns out, others had been employing techniques to grow 3D tissue like us from other organ systems as well as the brain. But those often included unpredictable combinations of cells from the brain and other tissues. The crucial element of our process was careful nurturing or guidance towards specific brain cell types. We used various combinations of molecules in the growth medium to guide the development of our organoids and mimic specific parts of the nervous system. For example, we allowed one to develop into a facsimile of the brain cerebral cortex, the outer layer of the brain that is responsible for our cognition. By using a slightly different molecular combination, we guided another organoid to develop into a structure resembling the developing brain subpallium, which gives rise to cells that fine-tune the activity of neurons in the cerebral cortex. When we put these two together, we discover something really fascinating. They started to communicate with each other. They fused. And specific cells started to move and assemble into networks much as they would in an actual brain. So we call this assembly of organoids assembloids and explore other combinations to create models that replicate brain function. One such combination was creating three distinct organoids, one from the cerebral cortex, one resembling the spinal cord, and another resembling muscle. We then put them together and saw the same fusing we saw in the two-part organoid combination. But 
when we applied a stimulus to one part of the assembloid, the cortical organoid, we saw the skeletal muscle contract on the opposite part. We had modeled for the first time a cortical motor pathway from cerebral cortex to spinal cord to muscle. So what does this mean? Using our assembly technology, we can create complex living models in our lab in order to safely study how disease progresses in a developing brain and, importantly, how we might be able to precisely target and treat it. Through this technology, we've been able to better understand forms of autism, schizophrenia, and how damage might be prevented in premature babies. And we hope to be able to take this knowledge and develop treatments and perhaps cures for this and many other serious and debilitating brain disorders, both acquired and hereditary. We're entering an era of molecular psychiatry, where historically poorly understood disorders can be framed by new biological insights that reveal how our brains and our minds work. The future in this area is very exciting. The technologies for investigating it hold great potential. And we, in the Pashka Lab here at Stanford Medicine and the Stanford Brain Organogenesis program that I direct, are working hard to realize that potential every day. Music